Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen. We're in a new series this morning, the Gospel of Luke. If you're not familiar with Luke, I want you to get familiar with this man. Luke was a believer. Luke was a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Luke was called the companion of the Apostle Paul. Paul said this in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He says, only Luke is with me. Luke was faithfully at the side of Paul through thick and thin. He started accompanying him right around the second missionary journey there that began as they left. They left Derby and Lystra and they found their way at Troas and at Troas God enlightened Paul and told him you need to go over to the area of Macedonia, the colony of Macedonia and there they would start church planting beginning at the, church, at the city of Philippi. Luke was the companion of Paul. Luke was a medical doctor. The Bible tells us in Colossians 4.14 Luke the physician, he was a true trained, certified, practicing medical doctor. He wasn't a quack. He was a doctor. He was educated. He was well-trained, very knowledgeable of medicine. I most likely he was a man who to- took the oath of Hippocrates as a doctor. Luke takes these, the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, two books which he authored, Two of the most prolific books of the New Testament. He had the privilege as an educator, as a physician, as a companion, as a Christian, as a man inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, prolifically helping us understand the gospel of Luke, the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. He helps us see Jesus from the islands of a doctor, a saved doctor. Not a secular doctor, a saved doctor. Luke writes his epistle and his, 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 this letter here, and he helps us to see Jesus and his power. The book of Luke is filled with the miracles of Christ. In fact, we get here to chapter one, we see two women that are, we see one woman that is unable to have children. She's past the age of childbearing, yet she is able to have a child. We find another woman in this chapter by the name of Mary. She is the only woman ever in history, the only woman ever will, that had a virgin birth. Doctors like to believe in science. They tell you they believe in science. Listen, I believe that Luke believed in the living God. He tells us in that passage there in Luke chapter 1, nothing is impossible with God. He tells about Jesus and his power. He tells about Jesus and his person. It's Luke that presents to us Jesus Christ in chapter 1 as the Son of the Highest and the Son of Man. As the Son of Man, he represents our Lord Jesus Christ as entering this world through a virgin birth. 100% man and still 100% God. Never leaving his essence. It's Luke who takes time from a doctor's understanding, doctor's viewpoint to help us understand the miracle and the, and the beauty and the wonderfulness and the veracity of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something right now. The virgin birth of Jesus Christ is an absolute fundamental that we must believe in. It's an absolute fundamental of the word of God. It is all truth. It is real there. It is not a fabricated lie. It is not something that some man made up or conjectured. But our Savior, Jesus Christ, came into this world through a virgin. Because if you don't have a virgin birth, you don't have a sinless Christ. You don't have a sinless Christ. You don't have a Christ that can die for the sins of all the world. Luke presents to us Jesus and his person. He presents Jesus and his power. He presents to us Jesus and his parables. We see some wonderful parables in the Gospel of Luke. He uses a parable about a man who needed three loaves of bread and came to the door of his neighbor, and he uses that to help us understand prayer. He's probably most prominently known for the parable found in Luke chapter 15 about the parable of the lost sheep, the lost silver, and the lost son.
Parables are stories cast alongside gospel truth to help us understand the gospel truth. He presents to us Jesus and his power, Jesus and his parables, Jesus and his person. He presents to us Jesus and his purpose. Our theme as we go through this study is Luke 19.10. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. By understanding Jesus' purpose, why he came, helps us to understand our purpose, why we are here on earth. I want you to understand something that applies to our message this morning. We see Luke present to us Jesus and our practices. How to live for Jesus. What are we supposed to do for Jesus? How do we conduct ourselves? And a key verse we're looking at this morning is Luke 1.13. He said to Zacharias, who was an old man, well stricken in years, thy prayer is heard. Our passage this morning illuminates and sheds some light to us on the matter called answered prayer. God is in the business of answering prayer, but we must understand how God answers prayer, why God answers prayer, and how do you get your prayers answered? He told Zacharias, thy prayer is heard. When our prayers get answered, we will say something like this, prayer works. How many believe prayer works, amen? We must understand some things the scriptures teach us about answered prayer. Notice first of all in our passage this morning, right here out of the scriptures itself, would you notice the first thing, which is the priestly representation God takes the spotlight and focuses on this man by the name of Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth. Zacharias' his profession was a priest in the service of God. He could trace his lineage all the way back to a priest by the name of Abiah. Abiah was a priest during the time of David when David was king, and David took that time to organize the priesthood, and he divided the priesthood into 24 different groups. A priest has certain requirements about him in terms of how he's supposed to live and how he's supposed to serve God. There were some very specific, restrictive things he did in the, in the service of God. One of those things that God gave to every priest was how he was supposed to marry. There were some very strict guidelines we read in Leviticus and in Deuteronomy about how he's supposed, he supposed to marry, the kind of wife he's supposed to have. And some might say, by the good fortune of man, that, that uh, Zacharias married this woman by the Elizabeth. I want to tell you, it wasn't by the good fortune of God. It was by the grace of God and God's will. He married Elizabeth. Because Elizabeth herself, she could trace her roots all the way back to Aaron, the brother of Moses. And through Aaron, we have what we call the Levitical or the Aaronic priesthood. The priesthood in that day had... 20,000 priests that served in the temple. Fathom that for just a moment. Every priest was required to serve at three major ceremonies. The Passover, Pentecost, the Feast of Tabernacles. All the priests served. But for everything else during the year, the priesthood was organized so there would be by, they would be chosen by lot, and every priest would put in two one weeks of service in the temple. And whatever that service would be would be designated by lot or selection. For instance, you, if you take notice here, we're told that he was, he was burning incense at the time of the burning of incense. Incense was burned every morning and every evening. Incense was burned after they would have the burnt offering and the meal offering and the drink offering. The incense would be burned at that time. In the evening, before all the offerings would be done, the incense would be burned at the evening. Incense would be burning all the time. For every priest, one of the joyous privileges for them was having those two one-week periods of the year where they would serve in the temple because they were chosen to serve God. 
And one of the great opportunities a priest would have would be the wonderful privilege, at least once in his lifetime, of standing at the altar of incense, also known as the golden altar, and offering or burning incense at that altar. That was a, considered a great privilege. And Zacharias had that privilege. The Bible tells us, I think it's in verse six, excuse me, verse six or seven, verse nine, excuse me, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. He was his turn. It was his opportunity. Someone had preceded him in doing the burnt offering. Some would precede him doing the meal offering. Some would precede him doing the drink offering. And then there would be a priest who would come that would take the hot coals of fire off the burnt offering, which was the, which was the brazen altar. Because remember that no sacrifices were ever done on the altar of incense. And they would take the hot burning coals and they would bring it over to that golden altar. And the golden altar, the altar of incense, was positioned right in front of the Holy of Holies. Beautiful picture of prayer. That priest would bring the fire there, and then the priest that would be burning the incense would come, and we find that right here. The Bible says in verse 11, he was standing on the right side, that, that, that he was there burning incense in verses 9 to 11. My friend, this morning as we look at this incense, it reminds us today that this incense is, a, is, if you would, a priestly representation of the prayers of God's people. Your prayers and mine are like incense that goes up to the Lord. God had prescribed that these certain compounds that would be used to make up this aromatic incense. And it's, a, it's, it's represented as an incense in the, in, the, in, the, in the nostrils of God. In Psalms 141, verse 2, the psalmist David said this, Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense. And the lifting up of my hands is the evening sacrifice. We get a picture of incense and prayer in Revelation 8, verses 3 and 4, where it says, And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was set before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Wherever there was incense burned, it represented the prayers of God's people. This beautiful golden altar made out of acacia wood and overlaid with gold, having four horns at each corner. It stood about three feet high. Each, 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 all four corners of this, of this golden altar was about 18 inches in, in its length there. And uh, the priest, one priest would come and would put, would put blood on the horns of the altar representing that was covered, the covering of blood and cleansing and so forth like that. But it was a beautiful picture, reminder that God's people and their prayers were like incense in the nostril of God. Now there's some lessons we could learn about this priestly representation. Lesson number one, we can learn this morning is God delights to hear you and me pray. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord, in the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee. God wants to hear you and I pray, amen? He delights to hear your voice. He wants to hear you pray. God wants us to pray always. Incense burned in the morning, incense burned in the evening. Listen, incense, incense represented that God, the prayers of God's people are to be continuously going on. The Bible tells us this in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. We're to pray without ceasing. Our prayers are to be continuous. Our prayers must be with importunity. We must pray persistently. Paul told us in Ephesians 6, 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit for all saints. Jesus said in Luke 18, 1, men ought always to pray and not to faint. Hey, these prayers, this incense burning up, going up was a reminder that we're to be praying always. Did you notice here that well, Zacharias was offering the incense there that the people, the Bible says in verse 10, the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. The people were not to be idling their time away. They associated, going back to the days of Moses, they associated the burning of incense. That's our time to pray. 
I want to encourage you this morning for 2022 that you pray. That you make prayer the better part of your day. That you make prayer, that you're going to up your prayer life. That you're going to start a prayer life. That you have time with God. I want to encourage you this morning. We see a great emphasis on God's people praying together. We sometimes call that partnership prayer. We call that here in Heritage Baptist Church our prayer groups. I encourage you to learn how to pray. I encourage you to be a part of a prayer group. And come down off your lofty seat and height and recognize today God loves to hear his people pray together. We must seek the Lord in prayer. Mind you, this morning, as we look at this man, Zechariah, and we see this priestly representation, he had a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I want to encourage you this year, in 2022, God might give you that once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. He may give you an opportunity unique this year. Don't squander, abuse, or misuse, or neglect that opportunity. Redeem the time, because the days indeed are evil. He had this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to stand before God at the altar of incense and burn the incense. And I want to tell you right now, I'm praying that God will give me some once-in-a-lifetime opportunities to preach his gospel and give his word to people that need to hear the word of God. And some of you have lost family members who need to get saved. And you might only get one shot. You may get one shot in the dark, one opportunity to get the gospel to them. Don't blow that opportunity. We see the priestly representation. But you notice, secondly, as the subject's on prayer, but you notice, secondly, the proper requirements. You know, when we come to prayer before God, we must be on praying ground. Now, God always meets us where we're at. We need to meet God where he's at. There are these proper requirements. If your prayers are not being answered the way you think they should be answered, it might be because you've not met the proper requirements. Before you begin, you need to understand the proper requirements. And let me say this morning, the proper requirements are not grievous or hard. There's the fellowship requirement. Did you notice verse 6? And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and the ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Now, righteous means that they had attained the righteousness which is of God by faith. Let me tell you, none of us, none of us here are righteous. There is none righteous. No, not one. All our righteousness are like filthy rags, Isaiah 64, 6. But we can attain a righteousness which is of God by faith. And the Apostle Paul talks about that in Romans 4, Philippians chapter 3. That righteousness which is of God by faith is when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. How many glad this morning that you're saved? Amen? You're saved. You attain the righteousness which is of God by faith. And by the way, if you're not saved this morning, if you're watching my life, so you're not saved this morning, if you're trying to get to heaven on your own righteousness, you're going to fail because there's none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says that they were righteous. That means they were saved. That means they were in submission. Submission is another way of saying they were obedient to God. They were compliant to the Lord. Notice the phrase says, walking in all the ordinances and commandments of the Lord, blameless. They were obedient. You know, Jesus gives us some insight about that. He tells us about prayer and obedience and prayer and compliance. He tells us in John chapter 15, verse 7, he says, if ye abide in me, that means fellowship. That means obedience. That means, that means uh, being righteous and walking in all the ordinances of the commandments of the Lord, blameless. He says, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Here does my Father glorify that you bear much fruit. 1 John 3, 22, John, and understanding that, John reiterated what Jesus said about that from John chapter 14. And in 1 John 3, 22, the apostle John said this, whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing to sight. There's a fellowship requirement. There's a fame requirement. The fame requirement is that we come to the Lord under the prestige, under the authority, under the power of the greatest name in all the universe, the name Jesus Christ. 
Jesus said in John 14, verse 13, listen, and whatsoever you at, you shall ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, that will I do. Several years ago, actually many years ago, I was at a conference, some of our men were with me. A very well-known pastor got up and he started preaching in this conference from John chapter 17 about the high priestly prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a powerful chapter, wonderful chapter. It's a chapter that really deserves much preaching. This man got up and he started getting to the passage. The more he got into the passage, the more we started to realize, at least I started to realize, he wasn't preaching the whole counsel of God. He was not preaching exactly what the Bible was saying there, the context there, the priestly prayer of Jesus. And to add insult to injury beyond all that, because he's preaching out of context, to add insult to injury, he got up and blatantly said to this congregation, about 2,000, 3,000 preachers and people that assembled there, and people watch my live stream. He says, I don't know why, but you don't have to pray in Jesus' name. And he went off on this tirade about not, why you don't need to pray in Jesus' name? The first thing came to my mind is this man is blaspheming the name of our Lord. I want to tell you, the Bible says we're to pray in Jesus' name. You see, his name is not just wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, only at Christmas time. It's not only when we sign our Christmas cards in Isaiah 9, 6. His name is wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace all the time. For the rising of the sun, the going down the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. I'm going to tell you, I don't care what your name is. I don't care what your name gets you access to. There's no name greater than the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. His name is above all names. Listen, his name, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord. And if you're having a hard time calling Jesus Lord right now, you will one day call him Lord. And if you won't call him Lord of every of your life, there's a day coming you will call him Lord. If you don't come to the throne of grace in the name of Jesus Christ, you have not met the proper requirement. The fellowship requirement, there's a fame requirement, there's a faith requirement. Jesus put it this way in Mark eleven twenty four. 24. He said, therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray. Did you notice the word believe? That means faith. Believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Now, faith praying, faith praying is asking God to do what you cannot do and anybody else can do. Faith praying is asking God to open a Red Sea, Jordan River, that turns little loaves and fishes and feeds the multitudes. It calms the storms. It's asking God to take the impossible and make it possible. We must have faith in our praying. For without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, we see the priestly representation, and we see the proper requirements, but let's get back to our passage. Notice verses 5 to 13. Notice we see the providential responses. Now, God always answers prayer. God always answers prayer. All of us, in a fleshly way, want our prayers answered directly. But as we study this passage and we look at the Bible, we must remind ourselves God is like, not like you and I. God, has a, God is greater than us. And the Apostle Paul described it this way, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. God always answers exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Now notice some things about how God answers our prayers. Would you write this down? Sometimes our answers are denied. God says no. He told Moses, thou shalt not go into the promised land. He told King Saul, who even though he made the pretense, he said, I have sinned. He, didn't, he wasn't repentant. He wasn't contrite. 
And Saul prayed to God in those latter years of his life, and the Bible says the Lord answered him not. Why does God deny our prayers? Sometimes denials are because of selfishness. Now God knows we have personal needs. For instance, we can pray. You know, we're given that model prayer. It's not the prayer we're supposed to pray, but it's a model for our praying. It says, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Listen to this. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven Give us this day our daily bread. Keep us from temptation. Those are our personal needs. But it's the selfish needs that get the denial. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not of your lust which warn your members? Ye fight and warn, ye lust, yet ye have not because ye ask not. And you ask and you ask and miss that you may consume it upon your own lust. I remind you today as you study James chapter 4 verses 1 to 3, selfish praying God cannot answer. We seek to consume it upon our own lust. And sometimes I think some of God's people like to put the square peg into the round hole. They want to force an answer that God never meant to answer. We're praying to consume it for our own lust. Some Christians treat God like a slot machine, excuse me. They think they put a coin in, pull the slot, God's gonna respond to them. They'll ask God to do something. And then if God does, and then his mercy and his grace, he answers, they totally forget that God did it for them. They're kind of like the lepers who Jesus cleansed of their leprosy, but only one came back and said, thank you, Jesus. They're denied for selfish reasons. Hey, listen, they're denied for sinful reasons. Psalm 66, 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If you have a dirty heart, God's not going to hear you. And I remind every married couple right now, if you've got, you've got problems in your marriage, God can't hear you. Listen, the Bible tells us specifically in 1 Peter 3, 7, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor to the wife as into the weak of vessel, as being heirs together the grace of God. that your prayers be not hindered. You're not right with God in your marriage. You're, don't expect God to help your children. Sometimes our prayers are denied for sovereign reasons. Sovereign means this. Are we praying in accordance with the will of God? 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 says, This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything and it be according to his will, he heareth us. Now listen, there are some things God makes very clear we're to pray for that's according to his will. We're to pray for souls to be saved. God will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. We should be praying for souls to be saved. Somebody say amen to that. We're to be praying for the Lord of the harvest and send forth labors into the harvest. We pray for preachers to be called and missionaries to be sent. We're to be praying for one another that we're all part of this great mission field and that we're all getting the gospel to people. Those are God's will. But sometimes when you get into personal praying, you need to examine your heart and ask yourself, is this praying in accordance to the will of God? And I'm going to tell you how do you know it's for the will of God in just a moment. But sometimes our answers are denied. Hey, notice, sometimes our answers are delayed. One preacher put it this way, timing is more important than time. God's timing prevails over our time. Our urgency is not his emergency. God is always on time. Daniel chapter 10, we have the story there about Daniel in the reign of Cyrus the king. Saw these visions and things and he was in deep turmoil and went to God in prayer for about three weeks, 24 days. He fasted and prayed. He said, God, I need to know 
what, what's this all about? He says, God, please show me what this is because he was a prophet of God. In verse 10, we read that God came to Daniel the prophet and put his hand on his shoulder. He said, Daniel, who is greatly beloved. He said, listen, I've heard your prayer. There was a hindrance for 21 days by the prince of Persia, but Michael the archangel came and prevailed over him. He says, your prayer is heard. It took a time. There was a delay, but God answered his prayer. Sometimes delays or God delays our answers to prayer because he just wants us to know he loves us. We have another example of that in John chapter 11. John chapter 11, we see a family situation. We have a family consisting of three siblings, Mary, Martha, and their brother Lazarus. Jesus went to their home. Jesus would welcome them their home. They were very close with one another. Christ even explained that he had a close affinity for them. He, he, the Bible tells in John chapter 11 that he loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus greatly. And Lazarus had contracted some type of a sickness, and his health was declining quickly. He was going downhill. And you can imagine Lazarus, as he was sick, that his breathing became more shallower. His blood pressure was dropping. He was becoming, he was in and out of things. He was getting very, very sick, and they didn't have all the medical technology we have today to help him. And frantically, Mary Martha sent a message to Jesus. She said, they said, he whom thou lovest is sick. Please come, Lord. They were praying and saying, Jesus, please come, like you and I would. When you get diagnosed with something like some of our church members this week, you pray, God, please do something. Please, God, I need you. Please, God, I need you right now. Your little baby goes from 101 fever to 103. Man, you're begging God. You're saying, God, please come down. You're like that nobleman who had a son that was dying. He walked all the way from Capernaum all the way to Cain of Galilee. He walked 15 miles. He could have gone on horseback, but he walked all that way. They probably ran there. He got to Jesus, and Jesus wanted to test to see if that man was really real. And he's pleaded, and he said, Sir, O oh Lord, come down. Ere my son die. He was pleading with urgency. Mary and Martha sent this request to Jesus, but Jesus didn't come immediately. He waited a few extra days. He delayed his coming. Theologically, we would classify that passage of Scripture, and what he does here is loves delays. But Jesus, as he made his way there, they, they, his disciples asked a question, and he gave us some enlightenment about why the Lord delays answering our prayers. Listen to me. He told those disciples, and as fresh as he told it there, it's fresh today, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. When he got there, Lazarus was already dead. In fact, he'd been laid in the grave for four days, exactly when the request came, and Jesus delayed the delay time plus travel time. He'd been laying in the grave four days. And the Lord wants us to know four days because the Jews understood that corruption or decay sets in right around the third day. After the third day, really. And they were heartbroken, they were grief-stricken, and Mary was the first to come to Jesus, and she said, Lord, Master, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I'm glad to tell you that in spite of those love's delays, God did raise Lazarus back up. She gave him, he gave her a new brother, a resurrected brother. She brought, he brought him out of the tomb there and gave Lazarus back. They had a little more time with Lazarus before he would pass another time and would be, his body would be laid in the grave. But there was the love's delay. The Lord delayed answering this prayer. Notice our passage in Zechariah. Zacharias, the Bible wants to know in verse 7 that he was old and stricken in years and Elizabeth was barren. They're well past the age of childbearing. Now God, God Zacharias and Elizabeth wanted a child when they were younger. But God delayed it many, many years later. God gave them a son. His name would be called John. What does God delay? Well, write the scripture down. Go to Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18. Would you go there? And sometimes God delays because he's teaching us how to wait. Do you notice Isaiah 30, 18, the Bible says, and therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you. 
Now, before you get mad at God for delaying your answer to prayer, never forget this, that the Bible says, and the Lord, therefore will the Lord wait that may be gracious unto you. Why does he make us wait? Number one, that he gets all the glory. Whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, that will I do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. This sickness is not unto death before the glory of God. Later on in John eleven forty, 40, he would make a similar statement to, to Mary and Martha. He would tell them, this is for the glory of God. God gets greater glory when it's according to his timing, not our timing. God delays because he wants to get the glory. But notice Isaiah 30, 18. God delays because he wants to distribute his grace to us. And therefore the Lord will wait. Then he may be gracious unto you. You know, the grace of God, notice if you go back to Luke chapter 1, the Bible says, The angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Now before she'd even conceive, God was already telling him, You're going to have a son. Big deal today is gender reveal celebrations. Well, God, had, God, God was the author of gender reveal. He told, he told Zacharias, You're going to have a son. He told him what his name would be. He not only told his name, but he distributed his grace upon Zacharias and Elizabeth. Because notice in verse 14, thou shalt have joy and gladness. Is that not the grace of God? And many shall rejoice in his birth. God's grace is not secluded to just you and I. When God pours out his grace in your life and mine, we're to be distributors of that grace to many other people there. And his grace, he told him more about the son. And his grace, he said, he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He's telling him, your son will follow according to the order of the Nazarite, according to Numbers chapter 6. His life service from the moment he's conceived is he's separated to the service of God. Praise the Lord. He shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. What an exceptional child. Sociologists today and family practitioners would say, perhaps this is a child prodigy. No, this is more than a child prodigy. This is a prophet of God. He shall go before him the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and of the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. God delays so that he can dispense his grace on your life and mine. Sometimes the answers are denied. Sometimes the answers are delayed. Hey, listen, sometimes the answers are different. That's what we find in this passage. God always answers our prayers. Did you know a no is just as much in the will of God as a yes? And do you know a delay, a delay in our, the answer of our prayers because God can see the picture better than you and I? Did you know when God answers our prayers differently, it's because there's something more powerful for us to get out of it than we can imagine? I've been preaching for the last couple weeks on Wednesday nights from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And you remember in 2 Corinthians 12 that Paul reveals to us that, that he had been given a thorn in the flesh. I described it this way. It's a very painful difficulty. In fact, it was so painful, he described it as this. He said, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. In other words, in other words it feels, he said, the demons have come and punched me right in the face. Paul went to God in prayer, and Paul was a great man of prayer, and he says, I besought the Lord thrice that he would take it away. Now, God answered him, but God answered him differently. Because you go, to, you go over there to 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and I love how it says, the Bible says, and he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. God's answer was not take it away so you wouldn't have pain, so you wouldn't have discomfort, so you wouldn't wake up having this problem. 
So you wouldn't be, so, so God, that was not God's prayer. That was not God's answer. God said, I could easily take it away and I could restore your eyesight and I could, I could have you feeling okay. But Paul, that's not my will for you. He says, my will for you, I'm gonna answer your prayer, but I'm gonna answer it differently. The way I'm gonna answer is that you would learn and experience my grace being sufficient for you because my strength is made perfect in your weakness. And you wonder why the pain persists. You wonder why the cancer doesn't go away. You wonder why your paralysis doesn't go away. You wonder why the blood pressure never comes down. You wonder why the medicine doesn't work. Is because God says, my grace is sufficient for thee. So that my strength is made perfect. Listen to me. God's strength is not made perfect in our strength. It's made perfect in our weakness. That's why Paul could see later on. Therefore, I... Most gladly will I take pleasure in my infirmities, in my necessities, in my persecutions, in my afflictions, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Sometimes the answers are different. Zacharias wanted a son. God gave him more than a son. God gave him John the Baptist. God gave him the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave him more than he asked for. When he told him all this description, all of a sudden, especially when he got to the part in verse 17, he shall go before him the spirit and power of your lives. He started realizing, God's given me more than a son. He's given me the one who will go in the spirit and power of Elijah. He's given me the one that later on Jesus would describe John the Baptist as being greater than the sons of men. God gave him more than just a son. God gave him a man who would change his generation. God gave him a son that would impact lives. God gave him a great prophet of God. God gave him more than what he asked for. A preacher by the name of Ed Solomon ministered down in the state of Florida many years ago. And he was one of those preachers that he had a way of saying things that kind of people were wondering, where is he going with this? If I said some of the things that Ed Solomon said at his pulpit, I'd probably get in trouble. He went to his alma mater where he got his training there as a, as a preacher, and he stood up in his alma mater, and a number of his church members came down there. His wife came down there with him, too, and he might say it was almost like a church service. In fact, it was a church service. It was down there at his alma mater. He was out there preaching, and he got up like that, that, that morning, and he said, you know, I've asked God for many things, and God many times did not give me what I asked for. As God to send me to certain college, and he sent me here. They're thinking, wow, what's wrong with this college? <laughs> I asked God to give me a church to pastor. I said, this is the kind of church I like to pastor, but God gave me this church. His church members said, wow, what's wrong with our church? <laughs> and then made things even more complicated or more amusing. He said, well, I asked God for a certain kind of wife, but he didn't give me the wife I asked for. And his wife was thinking, what are you saying? He said, no, God didn't give me the college I asked for, and God didn't give me the church I asked for, God didn't give me the wife I asked for. God gave me better than everything I asked for. God gives you better than what you ask for. Unto him who's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. We see the priestly representation. We see the proper requirements. We see the providential responses. What you notice as we close, going back to verse 13, Notice the precious reward. Zacharias kept praying. On the days he stood at the altar of incense, the practice of prayer probably gripped his heart at that moment more than any other time in his life. Do you know the smell of incense was all over him when he left? When you're finished praying, the smell of prayer, the smell of heaven should be all over you when you're done. People ought to know that you've been in the presence of God. You can't fabricate and make that up. And though the people outside didn't know what he was praying for, God knew what he was praying for. He kept praying. He kept praying in faith. He kept praying that God would be glorified. He kept praying for the grace of God to be dispensed on his life, and God gave him more than what he asked for. We'll see more about that another time. He fulfilled what Hebrews 11, 6 says, that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. 
Verse 13, the Bible says God gave him a son whose name would be John. The name John means Jehovah is gracious. Zechariah's name means the Lord remembered. The custom was you would name your son after you. Zechariah, God withheld his speech. His tongue was all tied up. Couldn't speak for several months, nine months to be exact. Another message. When John was born, everyone got used to the fact that Zacharias had to communicate by writing on a tablet, writing on a scroll. And when the boy was born, Elizabeth said immediately, because she was an honorable woman, a godly woman, his name will be called John. And the people were against that. You know, the majority, majority might be against you. It doesn't matter if the majority is against you. If it's God's will, you better follow God. The majority is not always right. They said, no one in your family has ever been named like that. They said, how can his name be John? What does his father have to say? And then Zacharias stood up and he got out of whatever writing apparatus he had. And he wrote out, his name should be called John. And God opened his mouth so he could speak after that. The name means Jehovah is gracious. He would be the Baptist who would tell everybody about Jesus. That's what's unique about being a Baptist. Baptist Tell people about Jesus. Somebody say amen. Every time his name would be called John, they would think Jehovah is gracious. And I want to tell you today, God is gracious. I want to encourage you this morning to receive the grace of God in your life. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. God's grace is his love, which we don't deserve. His open arms extended to you to receive the free gift of eternal life. It's not of works. It's the gift of God. John was the gift of God to Elizabeth and to Zacharias. The answer to prayer was the gift of God. God doesn't owe you and me anything. It's only by the privilege of God, by his grace, we can pray. If you're not saved this morning, I invite you to receive the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. I encourage every Christian this morning, live streaming in person, if you don't have a prayer life, start a prayer life. Start a daily time with God. Remember your prayers are like incense before God. You ought to be smelling like you've been in the presence of God when you're done. Develop a prayer time. Learn to pray. Participate in a prayer group this year. Get involved. He said, thy prayer is heard. Let's stand. Heads bowed and eyes closed.